Hi, I'm James Barron. I'd like to welcome you to today's Zoom. We're really thrilled to have Roscoe Hall, who is the subject of our exhibition at James Barron Art, at, which is called Governmental Promises. Um, a very special thank you to Scott Miller and to Mary Sheldon Hornsby for their effort. We're collaborating with their gallery down in Birmingham, Alabama. Roscoe, Hello. welcome. How are you today? Good. How are you, James? Uh, thank Hello. you so much for this. You know, uh, this is one of these shows that we really care about. Like, first yeah. off, it was amazing to welcome you here and Great to, uh, to show you this area of our neck of the woods up here. We're really proud of the fact that we're trying to do something a little bit different with a gallery that has, you know, a really high focus on art that matters. And yet, you know, we are, um, we're in the middle of nature up here, as you saw. So it's fun to kind of show you around. <laughs> it was, uh, I'm still thinking I'm there. It was that, <laughs> it touched me. I had no idea that I miss nature that much. It was actually really cool also because we were able to like, kind of set up a meeting for you up at um, you know, the Wasaic Project, which yes. is a great artist residency in our area. Mm -hmm. So it's such an unusual area. We also had our kind of celebration dinner at the Lantern, which is this super cool place. Yes. Where casual and um, with the gang from Birmingham, we were able to kind of celebrate your show. So um, just to kind of start in on our conversation, we're looking at one of the central um, images of our show, mm -hmm. four paintings. Um, this is one of the easiest shows we've ever installed. <laughs> I just had it in my mind where everything was going to go. It was like, <laughs> it was like clockwork. Uh -huh. The first time I walked into the show after we had it installed, I was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, it's powerful work. So, Thank also, you. Um, Maria, are you going to do the slides? So, we're going to look at the next slide. Um, you know, here's one that kind of is an introduction to the idea, one of the central premises mm -hmm. of the show. Can you lead us through this, Roscoe? Yes, this is uh, Who Breaks. Uh, I love this piece. It was literally the first one I did for this series. Um, this majority started with pastels, acrylic to Titan. Uh, obviously, lots of sativa puffs. Um, and, <laughs> and the impact of the government and love on canvas this piece so the purpose of the show was me figuring out what why everyone's waiting on something like everyone's waiting for what's next um that was heightened during the pandemic for sure but for me it all started when i recently had achilles tendon surgery and i was stuck on the couch for about eight weeks and started watching reruns of 60 minutes like you do at this age and I remember a piece that was based in Sudan, I believe, where American government was dropping what to me looked like red balloons, but they were like parachutes full of food to feed villages for a certain amount of time, like a ration almost. But when people ran out, they often got pelted. Some died, some stole. Um, the positive did not outdo the negative with this, but it definitely got people constantly on a turmoil of what's next. Like, where am I gonna get it from next? Like, what's the government have for me? What's the promise? Um, the two households hold the fear and the negligence that pushes everyone outside to go find what's next. Um, and those two houses, are on my family's property in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, that we, we recently just lost the property, actually. I think right before I had the show. Um, so to me, that's my outlook of government promises. You saw a lot of in the Southeast, you see a lot of African-Americans and just people waiting on the next movement. And sometimes that next movement has nothing to do with the government, you know? Okay, Kirshner. I mean, what an interesting influence. Um, oh, can Kirshner to me embodies like the tweaking of the shadow through soft palettes. Um, yeah, I learned from Kirshner is how to build a character 
by filling in the back well, like the background, filling in the void, basically, um, which can come out kind of eerie, but it really leans on your wrist and technique and how to build a character because that's what it's all about like if i'm going to paint i'm going to constantly educate myself so through deletion through bold colors like kirshner builds like a scene that's unlike any other and i study it throughout each piece that i touched on for this show for sure and definitely for much later Very it's interesting. also the three figures in the front they've mm -hmm. got a certain frontality that mm -hmm. actually I see a little bit in a couple of the smaller paintings in particular that you did. Yes, it's the simple dots. Like I'm a huge fan of like completing an expression through a small touch of the brush, you know? And that gesture format that he, that Kirshner encompasses behind those figures, like you see the far right figure with the pink going in. It mm -hmm. dials in a shoulder immediately, but then you lose the right arm and then you just go back to the eye direction. And then you look at the character on the far left and his right eye is pointing towards that. It's just a line distraction. I really love it. Um, you can decipher all that. This is a great piece. Great it's really piece. interesting. I mean, I was thinking about the relation. You're talking about like a little touch in relation to your cooking. I mean, it's almost like you've got the body of the dish and all of a sudden you put a spice in and then it's like, mm -hmm. right? Yes, yes. I mean, cooking and art, you know, I could go days about that conversation through black representation, through black creativity, through the history of food. And it all comes back to studying the classics and how you tweak it. And that, <laughs> I didn't do that on purpose, but what I just said is the embodiment of Kirshner's work for sure, studying the clack classics and, and it's also very interesting just this idea of nourishment you know mm -hmm. we eat for nourishment it's not just for aesthetic or you know uh, or pleasure and the same thing with paintings however mm -hmm. when you really think about it paintings are giving us like a visual and a soulful nourishment and it's okay. these tiny little touches mm -hmm. next slide please most therapeutic thing for me that's a beautiful to look at art and therapeutic for you to make art, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, always. Here's another Kirshner with these figures. Uh -huh. um, you talk about how, in particular, the, the female figure in the back, how there are these patches of color across the face. And then maybe we look at one of your paintings right after. It's the vibration, um, the temperature of the pulse and the feeling of the character he's trying to show, like technically representation, Everyone does everything differently. I and mean, you see shortened arms here on the left character, but you see almost a perfectly elongated right arm on the far right figure. But that pink, um, it's not just about the color palette because you can see the legs are darker, um, but it's a pulse. Um, it's showing you direction, it's showing you meaning and how they feel. That's how I interpret that. Roscoe, do you also see color in relation, let's say, to um, some sort of culinary sensation or something in food? Does that happen in your mind? Oh, absolutely, because the way I'm trained is you eat with your eyes first. Um, so to me, palettes are like very important and obviously texture. Because um, through cooking, it's all palate pleasing, but it's also for dorky chefs, Hey, you want to hit all senses. It wants to be, you have to make it beautiful. You have to have negative space. Everything has to have a purpose, but the texture has to come through. The rhythm of the dish through seasoning has to come through. And I incorporate all of that in my art. And you can see that in uh, this piece as well. And you've got a family history in cooking. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, I do. My um, grandfather in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, started a barbecue restaurant in 1956 called Dreamland Barbecue. It's um, it's a gem of a place in America, very famous for its um, slogan. It ain't nothing like a nowhere. And in each barbecue restaurant, there's a sign that says no farting. Um, <laughs> 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 but it's literally just ribs and bread um now they have like soda we recently the dreamland's a very touchy subject my family has been in the 
barbecue business since the 50s, but we moved in from Chicago to take it over um, with my immediate family, my mother, my sister, and my father. And through that, I learned the restaurant industry in the sense that I saw it, I saw it for all it's worth. I saw the profit, I saw the progression, I saw the depression, I saw the separation, I saw the downfall. Um, there was good times throughout all of that, but it set me up in a way to watch myself the way I work through the culinary industry, which, which to me, put it in this language when it comes to art, like food and art for me, I'll always go together because as I was getting through all the turmoil and watching my family progress and almost like res recently, like we lost the entire business um, and just financially implode all due to a bad deal. I kept myself painting after I'd get done from working in the kitchen to kind of void out all of that mess and just trying to remember to stay my course and not get so caught up in the industry, you know? Amazing how something like, you know, a practice of art making can keep you afloat during a really difficult time. Yes, <laughs> man, these days, <laughs> we're not even talking about we're not even talking about politics right now yeah. <laughs> can't even go there all right well here's an unusual influence um how did this come about with you i i had the chance to meet him and the gallery dress crew at dallas art fair and i looked at the work before i i introduced myself to any of them for a while. Like I stared at this for a day, didn't say anything, I didn't even introduce myself. And I just got really lost in all the characters and the facial expressions, the perspective of the characters, not to mention how great the actual ballrooms are. Um, There's just so much energy, but it was all very precise. I love the droopiness of the figures to describe like the booziness of everything, but you know, there's there's mischief in each one of uh, Will Hot's figures. I love, I love, love, love this work. <laughs> it's really amazing painting. But I do want to stop and say, as um, much as art fairs get kind of a bad reputation, some great uh -huh. things happen from a fair. You're introduced to an artist, you get a new obsession, it influences your work, or in my case, uh -huh. I saw your work, the Dallas Art Fair, twice with Scott Miller Projects. And I was immediately captivated. And then this exhibition that we have at the gallery is thanks to both Scott and my gallery mm -hmm. exhibiting at the same art fair. So there are a lot of intangibles that happen with fairs. Oh, anyway. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. Like, now that now they even mentioned that we sat around at night on chilly nights near that pool with the gang from Birmingham smoking these cigars and drinking some really rancid looking green liquid that I think is not <laughs> blue or something like that, that I would never touch. Like I'm more like the type that drinks seaweed or something like that, you know, or algae. Um, but it was such a blast, kind of like came back with you guys. Yes. I think I brought some tequila out to kind of like yes. get something in the mix there. Yes. <laughs> the next slide, but art fairs, here's to the Dallas fair that, that our Our connection it was thanks to that mm -hmm. it was a great time. total this is a total kick-ass painting this, I love this piece. really captures me um it's kind of a funny painting because sometimes you get a painting and you say either this is the worst painting in the show or this is the best painting in the show and you have to figure yes. it out this is mm -hmm. one of the best paintings in the show but i did have that happen where there was a confusion in the motion kind of reminds me of um you know, inmates walking in a circle in um, Goya or Van Gogh. Uh huh. Yeah. Something very Francis Bacon going on here. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about this, meaning let's you talk about this. <laughs> Those are all three very huge influences when it comes to this show, especially this piece. I personally did not like this piece. Um, I don't know why. It just seemed like a poster. Um, it came off as like an album cover, like a poster. Um, but I didn't, I fell back in love with it when I came to visit in Connecticut. The whole point. So to me, I feel like the complexity of the African-American is a very unique starting point 
to like mix and work well with each other in America, we tend to tackle life very, um, how do you say, vibrant. We laugh, we hit, we scream, we dance. Um, we, you know, sometimes you see us laughing, we like get up from our seat and fall on the ground. Uh, it's just a, <laughs> a very lively outlook towards just being alive. Like no matter what's going on, we're very expression. We like to express in completely different ways. And this piece, you get that Nairobi like color background print that vibrates completely. I use cobalt till the way Southerners use it and Haitians use it and West Africans use it. It's a... Um, even at Dreamland, if you go to a barbecue restaurant, you'll see cobalt teal on the corners of buildings and around the windows. And that's to keep out bad spirits and to, you know, keep your nation as one and happy. And uh, oh, you'll see that a lot in my work. That orange is for a rebirth in the back. Um, it provides the rhythm to show you that nothing bad's going on. And the dark spots, as you can see, the light overrides it. Um, I was listening to the new Black Star album, which that's Yasin Bey, AKA Most Deaf and Talib Kweli based out of Brooklyn. And I believe Durban, Af Africa as well. Um, and their whole issue is talking about basically the whole point of like why we exist and what's next for us to tackle. And that being black creativity and let's, let's nourish it for the once for the first time and to me when you think about that let's talk about the attitude that a lot of people are scared of when they see a group of black men um if we act out and like high five or like kind of grab each other a lot of people will think that's a fight or it's like you know it's a fear that creates an interest almost and I feel like African American culture is very interesting. I think a lot of people would say that they love us, we move, we do a lot of stuff. But with this piece, I was just trying to show the expression of like, don't be scared of just animation of a human. Like we can't, we can't live in this world without like showing love through unique ways. And it's not through words, it's through touch and movement and attitude almost i i like this piece a lot i'm glad i'm glad we showed it james and scott thank you <laughs> i did not i mean we're seeing also the introduction which we'll talk about in the next couple of paintings of the application of material fabric yeah. denim right on to the painting which i think is also such an intriguing resonance going way back to african art um, let's look at the next one for a second. Ah, here oh, we go. This so this is the painting which we have right there. Yep. In the flesh. Um, wow, what a gorgeous painting. Um, tell us what's happening in this one. This piece is great. It's a self-portrait of me, though I'm a lot darker and a little bit chubbier. Um, it's me, basically 2008. Um, Portland, Oregon, specifically southeast, looking towards the Milwaukee Bridge, I think. Um, it was right before, it was right when Obama became president. And I was, you know, Portland's a very bright place in quotations. And I was slowly fading into the skin tone of that brightness while being lost, but at the same time feeling like there were so many new promises ahead within America and government. Um, I was numb, but I was excited. I was comfortable. Um, times were dark. You know, I was selling art out of my house via Craigslist and on the street. Ooh. But it was, we all had hope. I mean, that was a huge time. At my lowest point, one of my lowest points of my career within food and art, that this piece embodies exactly how I felt because I was constantly swiping away um, my roots. You know, I, I moved there, I cut my dreadlocks off and I wanted to see what it'd be like to be a normal black guy in like uh, Portland, Oregon, <laughs> not with dreads. And that's a tough city to do that in because it was like 2% African-American population. 
So I ended up knowing at least like 25 black people, which I've never had that many friends. I'm a boarding school kid. As far as brown skin friends go, I usually have about two or three in my crew, no matter what city I roll to. But in Portland, I had like Wu-Tang Clan status. I was at like 32 and we were going to reggae parties and just doing it big. They were treating us like kings in Portland. Um, and I used to listen to Earth, Wind and Fire, The Way of the World, because it just described what Obama was going to give us. And I just felt like everything was going to be all right. <laughs> well, it was a worldwide feeling. I was living in Rome at the time with my family, mm -hmm. Jeanette, who you met, my kids. Yes. And I would go to the vegetable market in the morning after Obama was elected. Mm -hmm. They came outside, you know, they're like ensconced with all these incredible fruits and vegetables. They came out, they hugged me, they kissed me, they said, thank you so much for this gift. You've given us, you've given the world this beautiful family. Michelle and the kids and the sense of hope was so tangible. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was a great moment. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the next please. Yeah. Wow. Well, here's an image that seems rather without hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we've all felt that way, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's um, I'm big into hand placement to describe a real feeling. Um, right. I love it, even if they're not correct. Um, I mean, you see skill in this work with etching and dry point that you don't see that often when it comes to a sensitive hand because a lot of etching and dry points like very strict you know what i mean like it's very dark but you see how light all this is to create a three-dimensional like feeling but also a form i mean i love man that hand is like i can look in your art and i can see that hand mm -hmm. it's amazing but what an unlikely influence. I really love that. An artist who's not exactly household name, oh. you don't go into the 200 best collectors in the world and mm -hmm. say a Catholic Colowitz, you know? So this yeah. is cool. uh -huh. Next, please. Back to our show. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, those nice. three just work so well together. They really do. Let's keep going. Oh, Here. to Stodge. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that charcoal in it. Can you talk about that a bit? The charcoal? Yeah. Well, my time at working with uh, barbecue, Rodney Scott's barbecue. Um, shout out to Rodney. My daddy's watching. But I learned basically how to cook everything with wood um, for the first time, like strict everything. Um, but I did notice like I could build my own coals. And with that came, I love using charcoal, but as of recently i realized i could just pulse it up because they sell like pulse charcoal at the art supply store you shouldn't buy that guys come on like make no, no, no. i mean your process is so much more interesting and it has not only resonance to your own cooking but mm -hmm. to your family's heritage of cooking so yeah. it has a deeper resonance which i think is uh apparent in the work you could see mm -hmm. it feel it yeah I mean, taking coals out of a pit, a fire pit, and pulsing them up in a food processor. <laughs> yeah. I love and, it. Like, you can't beat it. If you mix it with black pigment um, or even just water, you get this crazy crackle effect huh. with charcoal that you would never see. It actually becomes more of a hardened substance um, over time as it dries. And then when you put a medium on top of it, I could talk about this all day. Yeah, but also charcoal is really interesting because um, while fire is, you know, destruction, mm -hmm. causes an incredible amount of destruction, yeah. out of it is a rebirth. So it's almost like the artistic process of wiping a canvas clean and then something else pops right out of it. Yes. Yes. The next place. Mm. My prayers. I love this one. Yeah. And here you've got the fabric. You've got, you know, some really heavy duty collage going on. And then, so can you tell us like sometimes you're making a painting that automatically is almost like an out of head, out of mind decision to put mm -hmm. some canvas into it or some collage element? 
Yeah, I, it's for me again. It's about bringing you in through an impulse that's like the closest thing that I have, which is fabric off my body or just old clothes. Paper towels to represent the restaurant. But then over time, the more I learned that I use these, um, I find deeper meaning. Of them. Like this piece in particular has paper towels, but also has burlap from coffee bags from Africa, you know? Um, like in a poor, like disparate, like village where we take those beans and sell them for, you know, $12. I just bought like an $8 macadamia milk latte um, using these beans because the coffee shop I get them from gets me the bags. Um, this piece is, I, this piece is good because I believe for some period in my life, my mom made me say prayers at night uh, before I went to bed. And I think there was a title for those. Like it wasn't just good night prayers. It was like something. Um, but I remember that being like a great reset for the next day is what they got me to believe in my Catholic upbringing. Like if you pray, everything that you've done settles. And when you wake up, it shouldn't be as dark and there should be glimpses of like change. Uh, again, you have um, the houses, and like I mentioned, when we had the show originally, the week of the show is when we sold the last bit of property of the Dreamland property, and that house on the left is my Uncle Johnny's house. Um, he passed away while I was working on these pieces, so, you know, he comes up a lot in my work, but he was always waiting on a promise. In his case, it was narcotics, um, waiting on like the new, the new trap, basically, the new life. But at the same time, he prayed all the time. You know, he was a very religious person. So yeah, I'm famous for always writing on the back of my pieces. Um, obviously, that's where you, I mean, nobody signs on the front anymore. Uh, we saw a sign on the back for collectors. And I feel like if you're going to purchase my work, I should give you two things. Um, hilarious descriptions of exactly what I was doing and feeling at the time of making the piece. And maybe a little drawn on the back just for fun. Um, the Ode to a Stodge piece has a great background. Um, it says support our cooks. Um and those and tactics and you know hospitality in general and then you get the mediums which i mean you can read it through but acrylic charcoal indica edibles 10 milligrams ink pastel paper towels burlaps gialdonado cold modellos in a can cotton and curiosity um it's usually everything i embody during that piece um written on the back I think it's a fun thing it, I've been doing it for a long time but I recently have just started painting on canvas in the past two years I've been doing wood for majority of the time but now I really get to write it on there because it's almost like framed pieces oh man these look great so the piece on the far right is called exist it's one of my favorite pieces it's my my piece of the show that I adore and it deals with so much change that's going on and so many options of government promises. Um, how are you supposed to keep up? And a lot of my new pieces this year, you'll see a lot of feet due to me having surgery and I got really focused on my feet um, <laughs> and ankles. They swell and they're kind of, someone told me two years ago to take care of your feet the most important things on your body because without them you can't go through the struggle um and then ah uh, that sticks with me and then it so happens i hurt my foot but both all three of these pieces embody denim charcoal rayon cotton acrylic ink and basically just a lot of soul searching through within me now the fleet of drum go piece which i adore we showed that at the Dallas Art Fair. And it's, he was, Fleet of Drumgo was one of the Soledad Brothers, um, prison reform group. And he stuck out to me the most because of 
his push for change, but change within a community that had a lot to do with like self-help and self-medication. And that was through food, um, you know, just basically, basically a healthy body, state, and mind and stand on top of it. And his compassion came through colors and the textures of his life. Like, I, know, I was just really intrigued by him. And I feel like the color copper shows, uh, it actually does like the like use of copper, the color shows a little bit of a unity of energy within like the certainty of people. So when you're around them, you vibe, basically that's where the term vibe comes from. Um, but in that piece particularly, if you could see it, yeah, Fleet of Drum Go, it has acrylic ink, paper towels, ground coffee filters, all purpose flour, indica hybrid, 10 milligram lemon edibles, oat milk, love and Tevin Campbell, which I love Tevin Campbell, Can We Talk is one of the best songs ever. But this piece is wild because um, ground coffee filters is what you can purchase to make your own paper. But I would take them and uh, I would take coffee filters, dehydrate them myself, pulse them up again in the food processor. And then you get this very hairy product in which on top of acrylic paint and mediums, I would sprinkle it slowly in certain spaces to show you the hairs of the face or follicles, if you will, of like whatever and pores. But over time, as it sits with these mediums and acrylic, it blends and spreads over the entire figure, making this like intense like surface connection that will build out and match all the other stuff that I put to my canvases and to my images. And so, I mean, that's the cool thing about this piece. Is we haven't even seen what it's gonna do in like another five years all those natural hairs will spread out from the coffee filters and give it a whole new, almost like curing the face, curing the piece almost. I love working with these coffee filters, guys. But Fleet of Drum Go, huge inspiration in my every day, but also raising my family, um, being a better husband, definitely trying to be a better friend um, and knowing where I come from. Yeah. Next slide, please. It's the side of painting, which is such a trip. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how these things, uh, I don't even remember doing these things sometimes. That's what I like. I like when an artist doesn't remember doing it because it's like you're kind of out of your head, you're moving forward, and then you look afterwards and say, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that's the majority of my work. <laughs> well, that's the best. That's why we love you. Next slide, please. Uh, Velasco. Yeah. So I literally saw this painting two weeks ago. This is in uh, Palazzo Doria Pamphili in Rome. Uh -huh. It's the thing that inspired Francis Bacon with his Pope series. Yeah. Um, there's the gaze, and uh -huh. anywhere in the room, you feel like this Pope is looking at you and <laughs> really happy with you and what you're doing. <laughs> um, tell me about how this painting influenced you, Velasco. Well, his paintings get me based on what you just said, the gaze. Um, I mean, not to mention the color tones also, because the shadow build out uh, within his work is always a very heavy attraction point. But for me, this particular show, it was really about the gaze. I was gonna tackle the gaze in a whole new way because in my past pieces, it's been more about fabric, but the eyeball direction, I'm really attracted to. Um, the whites have to be a certain you know, extent to push you that way. I mean, like you mentioned, it felt like the Pope was mad at you or just following you and wanted you to talk to him. Um, I feel like that's the best way to draw viewers in. And then once I get your eyes, you're gonna fall into my fabric and then you're gonna fall back to the color and then it embodies everything I'm trying to do. Um, this fabric, by the way, in the painting is insane. This mm -hmm. kind of, it's like he's taking the brush, he's just going back and forth with the white. And mm -hmm. he's, it's almost like furiously painting it in, but it feels almost like feathers. It's really wild how it got that way. The, the thing in his hand. Um, yeah. You saw that. Yeah. It's That's interesting crazy. because one of his hands is painted. Let's go back and we'll look at this for one second. There's, um, One of the hands, his left hand, is holding this, you know, this note 
and it's mm-hmm. articulated so beautifully, the shadow on the thumb and the way he's yeah. clasping the paper. And then the other one is kind of a funny hand. It's a little bit <laughs> small, it's a little bit limp. You know what I'm saying? It's like he's relaxed. <laughs> I'm gonna relax. Totally not I'm relax. just trying to relax. <laughs> yeah. I would love to see I mean, that. that's one of the great paintings. It's also very interesting because uh, Francis Bacon mm-hmm. painted from an illustration of this. Yeah. Not from the actual painting. He didn't want to see the painting because he thought the painting would either disappoint him or that what he was drawing from was the reproduction of the painting, not the painting. Oh, wow. Really interesting. Yeah. Next, interesting. please. So here we've got the two. We've got the Pope kind of caged in mm-hmm. sort of space. You've got a little bit of that kind of space in your paintings. Oh, yeah, always. I, I, that's an happenstance. So I get that, that movement through charcoal um, from dropping it from above the canvas because it falls naturally on top of wet paint. Um, so that's how I get my movement, like the one on the left. Bacon, you know, Bacon was a, he, he dabbled in the cooking a little bit. Yeah, right. he used to cook for his homeboys. <laughs> a really dear friend of mine was Andrew Forge, who wrote one of the definitive books on Francis Bacon. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, it looks like he's throwing every technique in there. And he said he absolutely was. Yeah. He was um, insecure about mm-hmm. his ability. And he would sometimes throw the whole kitchen sink into it. Mm-hmm. And then there would be a click. And he, yeah. had, he also knew when to stop. Which yeah, I think is really important. Let's look at the next piece, play the next slide. Uh-huh. See, like, I think the ability of a painter to know when to stop is one of the most important things of everything. Yes, yeah, sure. you know, overwork. Mm-hmm. So here's a good example. Like you're painting, and then to the left, it's actually the right leg of the figure. Mm-hmm. It's like all of a sudden we see the blue jeans in there. Mm-hmm. Like you, did you rip them off your body and put them in the painting? I have before. I've been known yeah. to rip off the shirt. Definitely was ripped off because it was too small, and I got rid of it. Um, <laughs> those jeans could be Scott's, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of nice. I <laughs> you like this thing. Um, you know, while you're mentioning Scott, I always think it's very important that mm-hmm. an artist has a dealer who really can start out early, and there's a great dialogue. And I sense that with you and Scott Miller. I, I liken it to uh, a catcher being the dealer, yeah. helping get the ball and maybe give some signals and some guidance, but okay. you're the pitcher. And I do feel that with the two of you. So I'd like to tip my cap to mm-hmm. Scott Miller and to Mary Sheldon for this relationship, which they're nurturing. Thank you guys. Let's look at the next only because we've had so many technological glitches. <laughs> uh, well, we the people, Mary Warren. Sorry. Yes, yeah. huge fan, huge, huge fan. Yeah, shoelaces, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. The the voice behind uh, Ward's work is so contemporary while touching um, on like the basics of America. Uh, it's amazing the hidden voice behind it while it being so blunt, you know? Um, he's inspiration. I was listening to a lot of podcasts with Ward on it while doing the show and got really like, just based off craft and practice alone um, and just trying stuff, but also knowing where it's gonna end and practicing restraint. I just really got into it. Very similar to what you just said about bacon and just knowing restraint, like restraint in the kitchen. That's where I really practice restraint because if you overdo a dish, it's bad news bears. Um, so to practice that on canvas. Is- also, we're not going to get into that, you know, deep hole of politics. However, mm-hmm. we the people is a really interesting expression in relation to governmental promises. Yes. Because uh, there are promises to we the people, which are often delivered sometimes with good intent and sometimes mm-hmm. with a, a sense of trickery that there's going to be this incredible resurgence of well-being with mm-hmm. the people when it's not maybe the actual intent and we could talk about trickle-down economics for instance oh, yes. it's really about the people it's really about the elite uh-huh. doing even better and making even more money mm-hmm. uh, 
So it gets to this title of your show, which I think is incredibly poignant. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the next slide, please. Another influence. Uh, yeah, it's huge. I mean, obviously you can tell why I like it so much because of the porcelain. The porcelain China is fired. Obviously I love bone China because chefs take you know animal bones and grind them down and make their own plates at a lot of restaurants. But also when it comes to the drapery of fabric, um, the way it sits and to incorporate that within China is not that hard to do, but it is really hard to create those shadows and wrinkles and curves. I mean, look at that. And then what I it does- I like to say like when your fabrics are put in with the paint, mm -hmm. they don't feel like there's any flexibility with them except for the leg coming yes. off of the painting. They feel really oh, soft. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And that takes like a concentration. Like yep. you gotta know it's, it's deliberate, you know? It's definitely yeah. deliberate. Um, and I love, like, I'm new to this, how this work, but uh, definitely studied it in the past six months or so. Huge fan, cool. obviously. Next slide, please. Well, I'm gonna shoot rocks. Shoot tell rocks. us what the rocks are. Can you tell us what's going on with this basketball hoop? I, it's a quick, you know, shooting rocks can be a name for a lot of stuff. Like this piece has a lot of various meanings. Shooting rocks, obviously, this is acrylic, ink, flour, water, paper, towels, denim, um, vape disposables, lots of DJ Quick and Blackberry Farm Saison. Uh, every Sunday, when I moved here, I went to boarding school. And on Sundays, before I went back to school, me and my father would shoot hoops in front of our house on that same property that I keep bringing up. Um, and often we wouldn't have a ball. And I mean, a lot of my life I spent shooting rocks into and a hoop. And sometimes that hoop didn't have a backboard. Sometimes we didn't have a ball, so we shot rocks. But then now since that you know, happenstance, you know how paintings grow with you over time and the meaning, the more I look at this and the importance of what just happened to my family in Dreamland and Tuscaloosa, Shooting rocks has to do with the entire focus of um, minorities living in the United States, trying to do something better within the business aspect of it, catching a bad deal, but still shooting like, rocks and trying. Like it's a gumption um, decision, deliberately made off hope, but at the same time, you know, you get jagged rocks, you get huge boulders, you get a little bit of everything. How else are you going to succeed if you don't, you know, practice, obviously, but you're constantly shooting rocks, man. You're trying to hit it. You're trying to get it in the goal, whether it's a swish, backboard. Mason Plus. Uh, copper, man. Um, copper is the synergy of all things. It radiates um, the fluency of conductors in order to make things work. Uh, our pipes, electricity, cell phones, like all of it. You know, obviously, if you put a brown skin tone next to a copper wall, we're going to pop because um, we're beautiful skin. But this particular piece, like O to a stage, goes back to the kitchen. Um, mise en place means everything in its place. That is something we live and die by in the kitchen. When you prepare a recipe, you get all of your ingredients portioned out exactly before you start cooking. Um, I wish I could say I practice this in the studio. I do not really. I've, one day I'll have an assistant who will mix all my colors and I will have a mise en place, but I'm a little bit more sporadic as you should be when it comes to creativity. This piece is great because if you look at the background, also another thing that chefs use for our mise en place is a core container. Um, we you often see chefs drink water out of them, but that's how we organize everything in the walk-ins and like dry storage. I use them to paint, to mix my paints, but I wanted to do a series called the core container series for a bunch of chefs, but it started with a core container on the back, um, with ink and charcoal. And then I painted on top of it. I mean, Rocco, is this, um, a specific figure or is it sort of like at the, um, the men waiting at the bus stop where it's like an invented character? It's an invented character um, of just, you know, waiting for what's next, but kind of being content, you know, feeling it to me, I, you know, I always thought this piece was like the glimpse one, like the glimpse of hope, 
you know, like I got my shit together. What's next? Like I'm ready for you. Um, but it's still muted, you know? I mean, it's 2022, I'm still very numb. Sometimes things click um, in the midst of, you know, positioning and painting and placement, textures come in hand. And then all of a sudden you can see something that no one else can see and you can attack it softly. Um, and you get stuff like this. Um, <laughs> well, what I see here and what my meaning behind this is, is my grandfather spent a lot of time in a chair, just sitting and waiting on whatever. He was greeting people, waiting on dinner, you know, whatever. He was just waiting on stuff. Um, and I see that around the Southeast a lot. People sitting in rocking chairs and just staring at life like, you know, like they were promised something like bigger uh, that day and they're just out, they get up, they get outside and just wait like all day and rock back and forth. There's also something eerie about it though because you're missing out on so much change um, all based on a promise, you know, like no one's promised shit. Um, you know, that progression is within and it's kind of scary. Like that blue is the progression, that gray is the stagnant. And the green's just the terroir in which you move in. Um, and that yellow, the rocking of that chair is like the only glimpse of like the small fading progression that this person has in that seat. Oh, in community is great. In community, that's a great piece. There was a family, um, I used to work in a pizza business called Post Office Pies Pizza. My homie, John Hall, shout out to John if you're listening. Um, I used to sit in my car and paint. I do a lot of painting in my car before work. And I saw this family every day. Um, there was a church down the street that gave out free food to people to start their day. Um, and there was a mom and a child I always saw who often hid when they went to eat so his friends wouldn't see him eating. Food handed out to him. And she was slightly embarrassed. But I would see them start the day and move forward and end that that's a huge meaningful piece to me because I I painted that in my car over a week and I got to see that same scene for a week. I really hit home. This painting, uh, Roscoe, when I saw it, I told you it reminded me of there's a of like a gold ground painting, uh -huh. and that there's a painting they bought of Duccio. This tiny. Uh -huh. This is twelve by twelve inches. The Duccio might be, I don't know, like eight by four inches or something like that. And mm -hmm. at the bottom, there's a frame that has a burn hole. Oh yeah. The burn is from a candle. Mm -hmm. So it's used as an icon, as an object of hope and meditation, the frame had caught fire. As I recall, the Met bought it decades ago for mm -hmm. $53 million. Ooh. This painting to me <laughs> is like a gold ground painting. I adore this painting. I do too. Um, it was the final piece of the series. Like, like I'm looking forward. Like, I'm not waiting anymore. You know, like let's go, basically. And the copper again, huge focal point of the show is that synergy of connection and flowing throughout. Um, his facial expressions just dead on. Even the wood used. I'm really glad you chose uh, to show this. This is a lot like my older, older work, like pre-Canvas Roscoe with the paper towels and letting the wood grain do its job. Um, I'm not sure we have uh, an installation picture in this. Um, we do. This was Dylan's idea. We were trying to figure out where to put these two small paintings. Okay. And we have these easels, which are from Rome, really beautiful. But to put them out, they just felt like objects of contemplation. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing I like about art as small like this is, like you could put it in your suitcase and you could travel with it. You could take yeah. it to a hotel. If you're someone who's really uncomfortable in hotels with transition, <laughs> you could get a candle out, you could light the candle, <laughs> but would not catch it on fire. And it could be something that could rekindle a feeling of home for you. That's what I get with these small paintings. Even this painting of a mother and a child, mm -hmm. it feels like an icon. 
it feels like hope to me. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'd like to say that one of the things that we have an exhibition in our lower, lower gallery, a Winfred Rembert. Amazing. Yes. And Winfred Rembert, despite everything he went through in his life, which everybody should read his book, Chasing Me to the Grave. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a hope. He never lost hope. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I feel despite governmental promises is this is a, mm -hmm. this is a show of hope. It's something yes. I value in your work a lot, Roscoe. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, 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 copper is hope like that. The copper, I'm telling you, that's the synergy, man. <laughs> that's that vibration. Copper is also a penny, which has almost no monetary value right now, but it has a nostalgic value. It has a nostalgic, you can still put it on a train track mm -hmm. and you get squished and you can mm -hmm. still have something which is incredibly powerful. Uh -huh. Like the feeling of money being spread out and flattened yes. and then turned back into its original material, which is copper. Mm -hmm. So these two paintings um, are very special. And um, what you see behind is a field that we cleared when we built the studios here, the gallery, which I share with my wife, Jeanette Montgomery Barron, a photographer. And a lot of these rocks were just found that way in this field and we left them. There's a fire pit to the right, which uh, or to the right of the, between the two paintings, but to the right of the one painting, which also is a copper tone. Mm -hmm. and we have an open book, we'll show your work again when it's colder weather, we make a bonfire out there. Mm -hmm. Invariably, somebody comes with a guitar and they start playing music. People come inside, they go out, they have a drink outside, they come in, they talk. Mm -hmm. It's what we're really trying to get across at this gallery, which is it's about art and food and drink and music. I feel this really strongly in your work. Mm -hmm. It's something that comes through in every painting. So uh, Roscoe, mm -hmm. that's off to you. Thank you for everything. Thank you so much to you and your crew. This really, literally the, one of the best experiences of my life is having this exhibition. And for us too, we feel it in our heart. So um, it's what we're trying to do all the time is open up art for a different audience. Mm -hmm. And I can say for our neck of the woods, nobody has seen your work, but it's hitting people really strongly. And that's a great pleasure. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take good care. You too. Bye. Bye.